Thank you. We, um, I'm delighted to be able to invite Dr. Lindsay Thornton and our uh, Olympic panel up to the stage for our final keynote. Thank you. Thank you, Angus, and thank you to Angie for organizing this panel. We're going to get right down to it. Um, we're going to talk through some key experiences, challenges, and um, sociocultural implications of the most recent Winter Games in Pyeongchang, South Korea. I will, um, without further ado, allow the panelists to introduce themselves. Karen? Hi, I'm Karen McNeil, that's loud, um, with the Canadian Olympic Committee. Um, my journey into sport and performance psychology actually started with my experience as an athlete. Um, at growing up, I played sport all throughout the year and was fortunate enough to make it to the Team Canada level. Played for about a decade, but that first international match where I had the maple leaf on my back, I blew it. And it was absolutely due to the fact that I did not train my mind. Um, we were in Holland at the time, and so uh, as I was um, consoling myself in the Heineken tent, um, I decided never again. And so four degrees later and 20 year experience in sport and performance psychology, it's become my life's work and my passion. You guys have our bios, uh, so I'm not going to tell you a little bit, uh, tell you so much about the work I do. There's a broad scope of practice outside of sport and in organizations, clinics, and those kind of things. So you can have a read through that. More so um, for the games. My role there, I had two roles. So with the Canadian team, I was the lead mental health counselor. And under the guidance and wisdom of Derek Covington from the COC, developed this role basically to take care of the mental and emotional health of our Canadian team in addition to performance capacities. So, so my role was really to service uh, as a mental health counselor, crisis intervention and performance consultation, which we covered all of those. We had 12 other uh, MPCs at the games and in Canada our structure uh, we, w the, the mental performance is part of the integrative support team. Um, we have three leads, myself, Penny Werthner, and uh, Peter Jensen. Um, we're on a contract basis, and then we help support professional development, those kind of things. So the 12 MPCs kind of got their uh, designation by their sport. Um, that was my other role. I was one of those 12 MPCs. I was the um, sports psychologist for the Ski Cross Canadian team, and I'll talk most of my experience uh, with that. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Carolina Lundqvist. I'm from the Swedish Olympic Committee. And uh, I was in Pyeongchang this, this time. It's the second time I was at the Olympic Games. I'm uh, in the Olympic Committee. I'm working as responsible for the sports psychology or performance psychology support and coach services. So we are three persons working here. Uh, and I try to coordinate all the work. We also have uh, people, external consultants, so, sort of, uh, that we use. We were three people working in-house. Uh, my background is I'm, uh, I'm an associate professor in sports sciences and I'm also a clinical psychotherapist. So I do both clinical psychology and performance psychology. And it's also something we have within our system. We try to both support performance enhancement and clinical psychology issues. If it's not too severe, then we use external specialists. So at the Olympics, uh, I was primarily based in um, Pyeongchang village, the mountains, uh, where, uh, but I was also traveling around a bit between the villages because I, my responsibility was to support um, all athletes and coaches in the, in the team, and the team was 110 athletes. Uh, in a total, it was 231 persons in the Olympic team. So I traveled around a bit and I had one colleague with me and we also worked really, really close to the medical team. So it was medical staff and it was we who were working at the Olympic Games, kind of supporting the athletes and the coaches at that time. Otherwise we have a l much bigger uh, multidisciplinary support team which we work really close with uh, du during the games or between the games. So th yeah, that's pretty much about me, yes. Hi, I'm Dr. Alex Cohen, um, Senior Sports Psychologist with the U.S. Olympic Committee. Um, 
We have seven full-time uh, sports psychologists with the USSC now, which is great that that number is growing. Um, so I'm a sports psychologist for winter sports. Um, the other sports psychologists work primarily with the summer sports and uh, Paralympics. Um, and so I was at uh, uh, Sochi for my first uh, Winter Olympic Games with the USOC, and then Pyeongchang was my uh, second uh, Olympic Winter Games. Um, we had uh, very good support, uh, you know, leading up to the Olympic Games throughout the quad. Uh, Sean McCann, uh, my colleague at the USOC, works with biathlon, so he was there in Pyeongchang, along with a number of excellent sports psychology contractors that work with uh, the winter NGBs throughout the quad to develop those relationships. Um, and you spoke to the logistics. That's it's an interesting thing at the games. Uh, if any of you have been there, um, there's um, two or, or more villages, and, and so sometimes transportation and being just available to your athletes and coaches and teams is is a bit of a challenge. Uh, I was based in the mountains for uh, the Pyeongchang Olympics and some transportation back and forth. Um, they just put in roundabouts for the first time in South Korea and. Um, <laughs> decided to teach people how to use them about a week before the games, I think. And so uh, transportation was, was often an issue. But uh, as with the other USOC sports psychologists, we're licensed psychologists with specialized training in, in sports psychology and, and CMPC. Um, and so we just had very healthy support for our athletes uh, up to uh, and during the games. Good morning, everyone. Um, just want to say thank you for having me on this panel. And it was very successful games for Canada and Pyeongchang, and it's an honor to represent with Karen uh, our country here today, so thank you. Um, so my name is Jeff Bernard, I'm based in uh, Montreal, Canada. Um, so how I got involved in the Olympic movement uh, in Canada, a little bit of a long story, but um, when I left the circus in 2013, um, and I started my business, it's very clear in my mind that I wanted to get involved with Olympic sport, because I was a huge fan of Olympic sport when I was a kid watching on TV, and I've always dreamed of winning Olympic gold medal myself. But the problem is I never played any Olympic sports. So that didn't work out. So the second dream I had was to help people win Olympic gold medals. So, um, so in 2013, I just purposefully got involved or contacted people that were involved in the Olympic movement and had my first shot working with an Olympic athlete. And I just focused on delivering the best service possible, doing the best work I could. And then just, that just led to working with several other athletes. So Pyeongchang were my second Olympics. Uh, Rio my, were my first ones in 2016. And um, in Pyeongchang, I worked with uh, seven athletes in five different sports. So it was quite challenging because I was accredited with three different federations. So I had to move a lot during the game. So I was there for 24 days, but lived in five different areas during those 24 days. So anyways, it was an interesting challenge and really fun. So it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be interesting to speak about that today. Thank you. Okay, so let's get into some of the content. First, I'd like for you to share um, w something that was rather memorable in your I about your experience in Pyeongchang and a specific lesson that you took away from that. Karen? Sure. Um, so for me, I think one of the greatest moments was actually this ski cross event, the, the men's and women's event. And throughout the quad, uh, we did a lot of work on trying to build a high performance team culture with the shared mission of personal best performances um, at key events. A another thing we tried to do is in the Olympic cycle, as we know with funding partners, et cetera, a lot of focus goes to results and medals and those kind of things. And so we, we kind of flip that challenge uh, or, or flip that into a different challenge, which is um, can I be the best version of myself when it counts the most? And so, at the event, uh, we had the most successful games uh, to date. Um, we had a gold and silver on the women's side and a gold and fourth on the men's side. And I can honestly say, yes, the gold medal's great and yay results. It was the athletes coming up to me after and saying, Karen, I can honestly say I was the best version of myself today. And as a consultant, that's super rewarding. So, so let's pull back, let's, let's pull on that string a little bit in terms of some of the difference makers when, when, I, when I reflect on that. I think there's a few things is number one, high performance team culture. And, and before I kind of started with this group, there, there were some challenges, but really it's about building a, a common vision, um, being clear on the rules of that culture and having a, an accountability source. So that would be one thing. 
Number two, almost paradoxically, doxically, um, take care of the individual and, and what are their needs. And so on my side, it was around developing a mental fitness profile and working with that athlete throughout the quad to make sure that they were prepared, resilient, and ready. Mindfulness. I, I definitely that was that was a piece of it. We dripped it into our um, into the training throughout the quad. We had a sponsorship with Headspace the last year and, and had a social competition on how many mindfulness minutes. And you never know the effect until it comes out in an interview. So our gold medalist on the men's side, he was fourth at Sochi, and um, uh, the quote read, "Every time I thought back to Sochi, I just thought, be here now in Korea." So that was just an example. And then lastly, what Penny, uh, Dr. Werthner was talking about yesterday was the importance of leadership buy-in, coach buy-in, and that MPC athlete um, coach relationship. So those would be some of the difference makers that I think contribute to the success. Uh, this question about the greatest moments, I think this is the most common question I get when I come back home because that's what people usually expect, that you should have great moments, and of course I have. Uh, but I just want to raise one thing, like you said, that uh, during the games, I was there for 27 days. Uh, it was really long working hours. I slept too little. Uh, you travel around a lot. You're always available. So I think that's something you really, really need to be prepared for when you're going to the games, not just the great moments. Uh, but if I, when I think back, uh, when I think about the greatest moments, I think they are related to a little bit, like you said, these re rewarding moments uh, when you actually see that the work you have done with athletes, with teams, with coaches, uh, that it's actually giving results for them. It helps them. They are prepared. So uh, I put a lot of work before the games. Mo um, most of my work is before the games. Uh, I don't do that much during the games, I would say. I'm kind of simply reminding them what to do during the games. Uh, but the most work is before the games. And uh, for example, I had worked with one team. It was a young team. Uh, it was the first Olympic Games. Uh, they didn't really know what to expect when they should get there. So we had put a lot of efforts in the preparations. We had watched video games of other teams playing the previous games. Uh, we had talked about how to behave towards each other in the village because they would play there for a long time. And we had really discussed a lot of scenarios. So during the games, when we came there, they had some problems in the qualifications. So uh, it was actually a technical problem. So they lost against the team they should have won against. Uh, and for me, it was like, oh, this is going to be a stressful situation for them. So I, text, I sent a text message to them by cell phone. Hey, how, how is everything going? And they just asked me, it's OK. We just follow our plan. And for me, that's really, really rewarding. I don't have to do anything. I'm just kind of checking them up. Is everything OK? We know how to handle the situation. I, we are prepared for it, and so on. So that's, I think, that's the greatest moments when you really get that response from the athletes uh, when it when they need it at most. I would say. Thank you, Caroline and Alex. Thanks. Uh, I think you'll probably hear similar things from each of us. Uh, the, the preparation that we try and do with athletes throughout the quad leading up to the games, um, and the, I mean the greatest moments I think for me are relational. The people that I was with and get to share these experiences with and. And having, you know, hanging out with JF at the bottom of, of uh, venues. Uh, and uh, so overall, the relational piece, I think, is, is a big moment. Um, but I think we're all really good scholar practitioners. Um, so when we talk about performance readiness, which you heard me say probably 100 times, uh, you're either getting ready to perform or not. And so when you've helped an athlete uh, to get ready to perform and it comes out at a games is, is pretty critical. And I always struggle to, to tell these stories because I'm never going to tell a story about this magic thing that I did with an athlete that helped him win because that's not really what we do, I, I hope. And, but I think it's also useful to hear concrete examples of, of what it's like in that experience. And so I got permission from one athlete to share um, how he was able to do what he did. And, and it's important that this was his second Olympics and he'd done very well at his first Olympics, um, and in his particular event, um, he, he didn't qualify well for the finals, um, and you get three runs uh, in the finals, and his first two runs, he didn't complete them for a couple of issues. So 
very critical in his third run. I mean, that's it. You gotta, you gotta make it happen or not. And and uh, Christian Swan and his colleagues are putting out some excellent research right now on flow versus clutch states and sort of analogous to letting it happen and making it happen. And um, if you're in that flow state, great, enjoy it. Don't take yourself out of it. But it's going to happen pretty rarely. And it, at least in the way they sort of look at this issue, it's pretty hard to be in a flow state when you're very aware of needing an important outcome. So a lot of time our job is helping athletes to make it happen under pressure. Uh, and this is a, a truly clutch performance. And one of the ways that I do that is to help athletes have a very specific external focus. And so uh, for some athletes, they might say, I need to make it happen. I better land this trick. Thinking about the outcome, the sort of classic outcome process thing we always talk about. Uh, so this athlete in his third run, truly clutch performance, um, did some things that had never been done uh, in, in his event before, uh, and had a very good outcome. And I asked him afterward, um, what was it that he did that, that made it clutch? And his coaches at the top, he, he said, wow, should I, should I scale back my run? Should it not be as difficult? And his coaches said, no, you came here to create. So that was his identity. That's what he wanted to do. And he said the specific external focus he had was not on landing his tricks, but on making sure that he initiated each of them very well. So it's very well and good to say, you know, oh, trust it or commit or whatever, but you have to know exactly where to send your focus. And if you can focus on the right thing at the right time at that moment, when everything goes out of your head and you completely forget how to ski and it's like an alien has taken over your body, if you can send your focus to a specific place and mindfully acknowledge and let go of anything that's getting in the way distraction-wise, you can perform in that moment. Um, it's always better in athletes' words than ours, so this is what he texted me after. He said, uh, wow, that was intense. There's mental toughness, mental preparedness, and then there's, holy shit, this is completely bonkers. I guess I better just go drop hammers. <laughs> and he did. Nice. Thank you, Alex. JF. <laughs> I wish I had a note like that, but I don't. <laughs> um, so like I said, there's, there's so many great moments for a country. It was, it was really great to be there. And it was, it was a tough question to, to answer in three minutes because you got you to choose. But, um, you know, uh, celebrating with the athletes and the coaches is special because you, you've been in the trenches with them and, you know, it's, you, you're so emotional. You can't prepare how you're going to react emotionally when someone win a, wins a gold medal. It's so, it's so special. So, you know, it's, you live, you, you cry, you laugh, uh, then you cry again and you laugh. Like, it's, it's really weird. But um, something that was quite special in Pyeongchang is, is actually celebrating with the parents. Um, and when I think of greatest moments, maybe because I'm a parent now and I have two young kids and I could put myself in their shoes, so, um, so this, one, this one moment, uh, an athlete won a gold medal one day, and the way it works at the Olympics is not for all sports, but for most sports, um, you, you receive your medal the next day or a little bit later on at an official area in the city where they, where they present the medals. And it's a really cool place. There's a big, big stadium, and it's outdoors, and there's a lot of people. So, uh, so I show up, and it's like minus 35 degrees Celsius. It's so cold, which is kind of like Montreal. But anyways, it was, it was really cold. And um, so I was there, and I was watching the ceremony, and th there's a ton of people. There's probably like 5,000 people there. And the reality of parents and family is athletes and even staff members, we don't really get to see them as we prepare for the competition, and we don't see them at the competition itself because of security and stuff, and we usually see them afterwards. So, so this one athlete wins a gold medal, and the next, uh, the next day I attend the ceremony, and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of people, and then I see the athlete's dad about 40 feet away and, and we lock eyes and, um, and he's pushing people away, weaving through to come see me. And this guy I've known, I've known a little bit, like we, we, we've seen each other in past competitions and stuff and it was very just, very formal handshakes and how you doing and a, a very religious guy and a you know, great father. So he's coming towards me in the crowd and then he gets to me and he bear hugs me and like kisses me on the cheek and he's crying. And he holds me so, so tight, I, I couldn't breathe. And I thought he broke my ribs. <laughs> and then he looks at me in the eyes and he says, we fucking did it. We fucking did it. And I was like, oh my God, I've never seen you in that, in that, in that, with that type of personality. But th those are moments that obviously I'll never forget. And my first reaction after that was, if I, am I ever going to live a moment like that ever in my life? And that's what the Olympics do. It's you live these, these situations that it's so intense and it's so special to be part of someone's dream because that's what we do in a sense. Like these, these athletes trust us to be 
on their team to help them achieve their dream, and that's, that's a privilege, so. Th thank you for sharing that, thank you. Um, the next uh, topic we'll switch to is just managing challenges and um, what that was like in the games environment and some of the key takeaways. So Karen, we'll start with you again. Uh, so I think the biggest challenge we faced was injury. And I don't know if everyone is familiar with ski cross, four people going down an icy track, turns, lots of jumps. So, so it's a high risk sport to begin with. Um, we started in October where our reigning gold medalist on the female side blew her ACL. Uh, she went and met with her medical team and they decided um, four months, we have four months, can we get her back? Let's try. And, and this athlete's very grounded and had good perspective. We had to hit, we had to hit milestones in order for her to um, you know, make the, the next way, but, but what are we all gonna do as a IST, as a team to help this individual athlete? So on my side, it was more around, um, like Penny said again, uh, technology. And so the, the visualization and the imagery program, um, the athletes competing on the World Cup circuit, we'd send back video and she could use VR or, or uh, watching it on a screen to kind of help her get performance ready in that moment. Um, long story short, four months to the day after that ACL, uh, in the qualifying heat, she won. She did not win the gold medal, but she won the qualifying heat. So I think it's, it's those challenges, it's what can you control and do all that you can and see what happens. The second uh, injury was this athlete's very unique story. Um, three Olympics, uh, three different Olympics, uh, three different sports two in the winter and one in the summer. Uh, for the summer one, I think it was 20, minute, 20 months before the games, called up the cycling coach, can I try out for your team? And then uh, fast forward to Rio with a bronze medal around her neck, right? So just speaks to, to the, the impressive nature of this athlete. Um, then she had to recondition herself for getting ready back for ski cross for her fourth games. And um, leading into the last World Cup before that event, uh, she was sitting second in the world, so she'd, she'd done her job. And at that last World Cup, broke both her legs and uh, tore her, um, some of her ligaments. And so that story was around her, um, around her struggles, but also the team. And, and it's the death of this Olympic story. Um, so we, we, we all had our own reactions to that. Let's go, go, let's go to the games now, and I don't know if you saw the picture of the, of the skier who was three stories high in the air, upside down, not a good position to be in. So that was one of our athletes, and once again, uh, injured, airlifted off mid-competition. Uh, so in that moment, it's trying to deal with your other athletes, be there, the parents, uh, making sure they're okay. And so there was a lot going on, needing to be present and mindful, but also taking care of this individual. Unfortunately, the exact same thing happened in the women's competition. We had another athlete airlifted off. Ski cross, right? Um, and, uh, but once again, it was that dealing with the parents and uh, dealing with the, the, the individual athletes who are still performing. Uh, so the takeaways, I think, within this challenge is, is really back to that developing that high-performance team culture um, so that we can have athletes uh, come and go within it because the culture around it is so strong, it informs the behavior. Um, I think building the individual resilience and, and performance and the preparation within the athletes is critical, and then that mindfulness piece. We don't know what's gonna happen, and, and in that moment, we just have to attend to what's the most important point. Thank you, Karen. Karen. Yeah. Uh, I think for Sweden, we had really a successful uh, games because uh, it was 40 medals, it was seven gold medals, it was the best ever game. So I think, again, I want to go back to the preparation. I think the most teams and athletes and coaches were really well prepared. So we didn't have really any big issues within the teams, I would say, but of course we had smaller ones. Uh, and one that I was uh, involved with in was uh, also uh, injury, of course. I think injury is a tricky part we at the Olympics because what, how much can you do and how, how should we solve this kind of situ situation at the games with limited resources and so on. Uh, in this case, it was uh, one uh, athlete. He had had a previous injury uh, before the games, uh, but from a medical point of view, he was okay to compete again. So that's why he was selected and he came to the games. 
what happened was um, when he was at the games, he suddenly started to feel pressure. And when the pressure com came on, uh, he also started to getting re-injured. So that he would, when, if he should compete, he should get re-injured. So that was his biggest worries. So uh, I hadn't worked with this athlete, I hadn't met him, I had met the coach, but I hadn't been involved working with them before the games. So actually it was the first time at the games I should start this work. And how I got involved was I was sitting in a sofa in the Swedish, uh, we have a Swedish, uh, I don't know what you call it guys, but head office, uh, headquarter, head office, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we have a lounge and p athletes can come there and drink coffee and it's quite relaxed, they can play video games. So I was, was sitting in there, it's a good place to be. Uh, sitting there drinking coffee, was quite relaxed myself and this athlete came sitting down next to me and I don't even think he said hi to me. He just immediately started to talk about this injury and his worries and so on. So it was, this is one moment you just have to kind of switch on. Um, okay. What's this all about? Uh, so we were talking a bit, and then I said to him, I, I need to s speak to your physiotherapist and your team doctor and so on, and coach, uh, and we met again. And I think one important part of this kind of situation is to take time to also get information about the medical status for this athlete, so I know if it's worry or is this some really an issue. Uh, so I talked to them, and then I met this athlete again. And for me, it was quite obvious this was worries. The, the injury was okay. It was just worry coming over this athlete in this moment. So uh, how to deal with this? I mean, this, this athlete, he couldn't com complete his practices. He was really, really emotional about it, really into his worry. So I think for me, the, the kind of key how I could start working with this athlete was that I, I asked him, I, I told him, that hey, nobody can force you to compete because that was, he, he thought, now when I'm at the Olympic Games, people are forcing me to compete. I have to compete. I don't want to do that. Uh, so I said to him that nobody can force you to compete. It's your free will. But what my concerns are really about, it's what's gonna happen two weeks, two weeks later when you're back home, you are thinking back of this moment. What will you think then? So just consider that. So this athlete here, here took some minutes and what he said was, you know what, I'm gonna regret it then. And that was kind of the key, I think, to, to be able to start working with this athlete. And then we did lots of other kind of works with him, uh, teamwork with physiotherapists, team doctors, and so on. But I think that was kind of a key to, to get to reach him in that kind of situation, to give him perspective and see, okay, not just the immediate emotions, but if you, two weeks later, what will happen then? How do you think then? So, yeah, it was quite a challenging situation because, uh, mainly because I hadn't worked with this guy before. Um, I guess in thinking about the question of a, a challenge at the games, I mean, that to have something that's both maybe Olympic specific, but also resonates broadly, hopefully, to other performance contexts. Um, I think we can all agree that the work works if athletes, if performers, if exercisers do it, right? Uh, it's not rocket surgery, the work works. So how do we get them to do the work? And it's something that I continue to struggle with. And I, I think in some ways in our setting, the best preparation for an Olympic games is having gone to another Olympics already. And so for first time Olympians, it's a particular challenge because there is simply nothing like it. I know you've all heard this and, and you know this experience, but there's nothing like it. It's not like World Cups or Grand Prix or World Championships. There's simply nothing like it, both logistically and, and the experience of it. And, and in some of our smaller sports, you look down and there's 10,000 people there and millions of people watching at home. And, and it's the first time that it's not just your mom and dad and Aunt Judy and right and whoever shows up, some friends. And so it's, it's just a different environment. And, and so we do a lot of things systemically, I think, to try to help with this. Um, from having our first time Olympians talk with, you know, senior mentor athletes who have been to multiple games or more than one games, uh, to get groups together uh, prior to the games to talk about the experience. And, and of course, we all do sort of performance simulation pieces. But, you know, coming back to that performance readiness piece, um, and I base that on Gabrielle Ottingen's excellent work around mental contrasting and implementation intention. And, and what do you do in that moment if you don't know how to respond to that adversity? So 
Positive thinking by itself just doesn't work, right? If you don't plan for that adversity. So how do you plan for that adversity for an experience that they haven't been in? How do you have that thing to go to? And I can't say it better than Ken. Like, feeling good is overrated. Have your best shitty day. So what are you going to do when, you know, you go into your games hoping it's going to be an amazing experience? Uh, and your first experience, as it was for some of our athletes, is, wow, we finally get to walk in as Team USA to opening ceremony. And it's the most magical moment that I've been looking forward to my whole sort of Olympic preparation career. And some of my teammates from other Team USA teams are elbowing me out of the way to get in front of the camera. And it ruins your opening ceremony experience. And right there, the, the whole game's experience in some way begins with disillusionment. How do you get refocused? I had no idea that was gonna happen. How do you plan for that? So you can't plan for everything, but for first time Olympians, what do you do? You have to have something to go to. If you have to decide in the moment how you're going to adjust to something unexpected, it's too late. So you have to decide ahead of time and, and how to create that clutch performance. And Gabrielle Wolf's work on external focus is pretty clear. If you can send your focus either near or far external, you have something to go to even if you don't feel good. And, and I think that's a particular challenge for first time Olympians. So I, if we had more time, I'd rather just have a conversation with the group about how people get athletes and coaches to do the work and to demonstrate the value of what we do. I think that's pretty critical. I think one reality we have to admit and think about is it's, it's every athlete's dream to go to the Olympics, but let's face it, it's every coach's dream to go to the Olympics as well. It's every MPC's dream to go to the Olympics. It's every massage therapist's dream to go to the Olympics. And I think, I think Canada, we do a great, great job to prepare athletes. Uh, we've seen it over in the last few games, but I think we can get better to prepare staff. Um, and I would argue there's a lot, and kind of piggyback on, on Penny's comment yesterday, there's, there's a tremendous amount of work that we can do, not only with the coaches, but with the staff that are around the athletes at the Olympic Games, because there's a lot of staff. And the reality is we do so much work the months before the Olympics to make sure the athletes come in fresh and rested and ready for the Olympics. But there's another reality that a lot of coaches come into the Olympics and they're already exhausted because it's, because it's a big lead up. So um, I can share a personal story. Like my first games in Rio, um, I did that okay. Like I, I was tired during the games and it, it was tough. It was rough and a little bit like Alex said, it was it were my first game. So it's very difficult to prepare for something that you don't know how it's going to unfold. So again, if I can piggyback on Tracy's comment yesterday when, you know, control the controllables. At the games, we don't control the athletes, we don't control the coaches, but we control ourselves. And I, and I think for every staff member to have a plan and how they go about their, how they stay healthy at the games and how they take care of themselves is not only talk about it, but actually really do it. Um, and, it and in a sense, it's, it's almost a shelf selfish thing, but you know, I would argue that if you don't do that, you can be more, if you're tired, and I know for myself, if I don't, if I don't exercise, if I don't eat well, if I don't sleep well, I'm grumpy. And I could actually be a distraction for, for athletes. Um, and I think that could be the same for a lot, of this, a lot of people in this room. So, you know, I, just before I left home, I remember my wife told me I was leaving and the kids were giving me kisses and stuff. And then she just said, she's a former varsity volleyball player, so she knows a lot about sport. And she says, um, bring back gold medals for, for Canada. So, um, so as I'm in the plane going to, um, to Pyeongchang, I had a thought at some point. I said, what's my mission? Why am I going to Pyeongchang? And my only mission was to help these individuals step on the podium. So one thing that I talked a lot with coaches, and we had some great conversations about that, is we want athletes to have gold medal worthy performances at the games. But how are we as staff going to find a way to have gold medal worthy performances ourselves? Because we also have to perform and be ready for these critical moments. So. Um, so I had a very disciplined lifestyle in Pyeongchang. Uh, made sure to work out at almost every morning, 6 a.m. in the gym. Um, what I ate was very boring. You know, oatmeal in the morning, my Greek yogurt, 10 o'clock. You know, chicken, rice, and and, and vegetables for lunch. It, it, it just because I need, you know, 24 straight days of work is not something that I know. Because at home, I usually work four days a week, more or less, and I take a lot of time off. So you have to go for something uncommon. You have to go about it in an uncommon way. So um, anyways, I, was, I, was, I ended up, I think, doing, um, and, and, and if I can talk about the, um, specifically about the uh, freestyle skiing team, uh, Marc-Andre Moreau, who was the HPD for the, uh, 
for them did a tremendous job to prepare the staff. And I witnessed a lot of moments where um, the coaches were unbelievably prepared. They were calm, they were in control, and it had an impact on the athletes. And even the athletes talked about it afterwards. So, um, so I think that was a big challenge for me, for a lot of people that were there, and we need to think more about that as we go forward. Great, thank you, JF. Let's briefly touch on um, some of the social culture implications for the, for the work you did in Pyeongchang, and then we'll hope to have a few minutes left uh, for questions. So Karen. Yeah, so, so in thinking about the social culture, I think in, in Canada, for, for us anyway, it's not so much about the political context and what's happening between North and South Korea. Um, the way I, th I look at this is more around the environment and the Olympic culture and what happens within the bubble. Um, and just what JF was referring to is it's like, it's like no other. And if you haven't experienced it before, um, we had a very seasoned uh, group of athletes and, 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 and coaches. Um, and so for us, it was really trying to balance how do I be the best version of myself on the day that matters? And how do I have the Olympic experience that's full and rich. And so it's a constant kind of um, navigation in terms of identifying what that looks like, but also mapping out what kind of Olympic experience do I want to have. And then it's that, that, that moment to moment regulation of where's my energy today? What do I need to do? Maybe I need to skip that event and actually just rest today. And so I think the Olympic culture, the distractions within the going to the dining center and seeing, you know, an, an athlete that, that you hold in uh, high regard. I mean, there's so many different things that can drain energy. I think to piggyback off of what JF was saying, um, we prep athletes, we prep coaches and staff, and I think we need to do the due diligence to make sure that we are optimally ready to perform in those moments. And so, same thing for me, I don't know if anyone's been to an Olympic Games environment, um, I'm a person who is high energy, I galvanize, galvanize off of people and environments, and it's like having an IV of Red Bull coursing through my veins. <laughs> I'm switched on. In 2002 at my first games, I didn't handle that well at all. Fast forward to now, um, I started a mindfulness course. I, mindfulness is a practice of mine, but I did an eight-week intensive in the fall just to boost that. I made sure I had my nutrition plan and would do a, a, a dense um, nutrition pack, Athletic Greens, every morning, a month before and during the games, my exercise, and then my support network talk to my peers um, around my issue, which was leaving my five-year-old daughter, and how was I gonna deal with that? Um, and how would I stay focused when there was something going on at home? So I think doing the work on ourselves, um, and really the social culture for me is the culture that exists within the Olympic bubble. Yeah, and I would agree with that, this bubble, and I would say that, uh, I mean, during the Olympic Games, it's quite an artificial world. Uh, most athletes, they say the, the venues are the same, but the village life is something else. So I think that's uh, the big thing with, uh, with Olympic Games. Uh, for me, I think uh, I, I would like to pick these small things. Um, being in South Korea, you don't really see much of the culture. You are in South Korea for a month, you don't see much of the culture. But one thing I think was a bit tricky when I was working was uh, we did have some volunteers who was helping us. And uh, most of them did not speak English so well, or not at all, actually. So you, should, you need to communicate with people who are there to help you to, to make everything going. Uh, so um, what, what can you do? Koreans were really good at using Google Translate. We communicate a lot by using Google Translate. And one quite funny story was when um, I was um, working with a team and, and I should uh, actually help them because all coaches were, were needed at the venues. So I should say, that, hey, I can help you with driving the athletes back of the competition because they needed to get back to the village and they needed to get food and recovery. And for me, it was a great opportunity also to, to be able to talk to the athletes after the games, after the competition. So this was quite a win-win situation. So I should go and pick the car up and uh, the situation was that it was 45 minutes before I should needed to be there with a the car and, and pick the athletes up. And when I pressed the start button, nothing happened. And I pressed the start button, nothing happened. And then I just realized that somebody left the lights on, uh, so the battery was out of power. And I was standing in the parking lot, it was empty, it was minus 
20 degrees Celsius. It was icy, you cannot even take your gloves off. So what to do? I was looking in the, uh, of the, for the papers in the car, everything was in Korean, I couldn't understand anything. <laughs> okay, I saw what, saw, saw what time was ticking. Uh, fortunately, there was one Korean man there kind of supervising this parking uh, lot, I think. So I, by again using Google Translate, tried to explain the situation. He was start calling, we couldn't communicate any other way. He started to call somebody, I had no idea what was happening. And suddenly, after like 10 minutes, 10, 15 police, uh, Korean police officers <laughs> showed up. <laughs> all around my car, all working really, really hard with this car. And I can say you, we all celebrated together <laughs> at that moment when the car <laughs> finally started. So it was, I, I really, one thing I regret is that I didn't take a picture of it. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, with these stories, some cultural things you will notice during the games, so some we will not notice, and I think this is also something to take with you. What are you doing during the games? Some, some things we are doing is not actually related to just sitting speaking with athletes or coaches. We have to do all the other things too. We have, well, at least in Sweden, we have too few hands, so every hand is needed to, to help each other out. So kind, kind of this situation might happen. There's so many good examples like that. I mean, it is a global sport experience. Um, I don't know about for other countries, but for USA, it's definitely a political event. And the IOC would like to say it's apolitical, and that's just inherently not true. I mean, it's why the games, the modern games, were created in many ways. Um, and I don't know if you follow US politics at all, but uh, <laughs> going into the games, um, uh, there was a bit of um, back and forth between um, President Trump and Kim Jong-un and some name calling a little bit and uh, probably not the best thing to do to, to provoke somebody right before sending a lot of people over to a country where there's a lot of nuclear weapons. But in doing site visits before the Olympics, um, one of the things that became very clear and everybody that we spoke with in South Korea with the National uh, Olympic Committee there, no concern from South Korea about any retaliation or, or problems with North Korea because they live with it all the time. So uh, being able to bring that message back to Team USA athletes and coaches and parents especially, um, that it's in many ways sensationalized in the US media um, and that it's an incredibly safe place to be. Um, and in terms of the, you know, coming back to performance readiness, in terms of preparing athletes for that experience, just knowing your athletes, um, some athletes who are very concerned about that, we brought back pictures, videos of, you know, hey, here's the Pizza Hut and, you know, you're going to be in an in a bubble and it's going to be super safe and, and it's all the familiar things that, that you want to there. And then for the athletes who are more adventurous, it's a safe place to go explore. Um, uh, the language piece, of course, um, is always an issue. I, I just contrasting culturally my experience at the Sochi Olympic Winter Games, um, a bunch of 18 year olds with AK-47s at every checkpoint um, with no smiles. And you can talk your way through most things in most countries, but not there, whereas in South Korea, the, uh, not to generalize, but the most gracious hosts, like a, a truly welcoming ex experience for both Olympics and Paralympics, to the point where we're, after test events, we had to remind Team USA athletes, don't be an ugly American. It's gonna be so easy to take advantage of your host's profound graciousness and work ethic, uh, and they'll go out of their way to, to make sure you have a good experience, so don't take advantage of it. Uh, and some people did, and some athletes did. Um, and during the games, Olympic pins are just the currency. It, they're worthless after the games, right? But if you've got the, you know, for each sport or for Team USA or whatever, and just to see somebody's eyes light up, and that will get you through any checkpoint, regardless of language. It's amazing. You, there's an x-ray, right, going into every venue, and you do a bag check, and they throw your bag through the x-ray. They could care less what's in your bag, for the most part. Water, whatever, bring it in. They're x-raying your bag to look for pins. So if they have them in there, it's like, oh, do you have a pin? It, that will get you through anything. And it's, but it's, it's the little things like that that just, you know, it's, it's a multicultural experience and uh, every culture is unique in terms of performance readiness. I mean, Russia had to compete as Olympic athlete. And typically when a country is banned from competing at the games, you compete as Olympic athlete. They were allowed to compete as Olympic athlete Russia. How is that not Team Russia? It's inherently political. 
and our athletes knowing that they're competing against athletes that, to be honest, should not have been there. Right? How do you get them ready for that experience, knowing that they're going to share that environment? Thank you. And, and it's a unique thing where we're also friendship, excellence, respect, those are the Olympic values. Um, and yet, the IOC is, you know, ensuring that athletes can, it's an interesting thing politically. So I think like anything else that you're mindful about, you can't ignore it, you have to acknowledge it and come back to what you can control. Thanks, Alex, you just killed my story. Because <laughs> I was just gonna say politics uh, in some way is not important at the Olympics in a sense, like, um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so, you know, if you think about the Olympics, um, you know, everyone goes there, everyone's intense, everyone's passionate, everyone wants to win, and everyone's stressed out. That's the reality a little bit. Um, and some of the coolest conversations I had with athletes were at the cafeteria where we would have lunch together, and then I would just make them realize, like, look around you. Like, look around you. There's, there's athletes representing, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 different countries right now in this one building, Nobody cares about where you come from. Nobody cares about your, you know, if you're religious or not. Nobody cares about politics. And how many times and how many places on our planet does, does that happen? Um, it's very rare. And what's been cool in those conversations is it just real, makes the athlete realize, and myself and coaching staff, how it's a privilege to be part of that moment where we're all there for the same reasons and we're not talking about politics and we're not talking about the problems and wars going on in, on our planet. And all of a sudden we come back in our own little world and then, then it's everywhere in the news, right? Um, so I just want to share that. That's a cool moment about the Olympics. And the second thing very quickly um, about how things are set up at the Olympics. Um, it's true that there's a lot of the Olympics that makes it very different from World Cups and World Championships and, and other competitions. Um, so one thing that an athlete told me and I thought was pretty cool is that he wanted to be uh, like a chameleon at the Olympics. And, and what he meant by that was um, everything around his competition venue is unfamiliar. So like the cafeteria, you know, eating with different athletes from different sports, that's not, that doesn't happen in his World Cups. Taking a bus with different athletes from different countries, from different sports, that doesn't happen during his World Cups. Uh, living in a building with all these other Canadian athletes that they don't really know each other, but all of a sudden they're best friends, you know, over a short period of time, they're not, they're not used to that. So he would say that he wanted to be a chameleon and just kind of change colors um, and adapt to whatever's going on. But the moment that he got into his com com uh, competition venue, which is very similar to World Cups and World Championships, then he can choose the color he wants. And I thought that was a brilliant metaphor to, to just accept the fact that it's gonna be weird, it's gonna be different, everything that's not in my competition venue, but once I get there, I know what to do. This is, this is familiar, I know this. Yeah, maybe there's a little bit more cameras, the crowd's a little bit bigger, but most of it is quite, is quite the same. So I, I thought that was, that's quite neat that he came up with that metaphor. Thank you, Jaya. Kent, if this clock is correct, we do have a couple minutes for questions. Great, so um, anyone has a question and we'll try to be, to facilitate. Okay, it looks like a couple of people are getting up. So we're going to be as efficient with our responses as possible. So keep your question either um, concise without much lead in and, and we'll do our best to address it. Here we are. Thank you very much for all your perspectives. So my question is to the panel about preparation. Um, so best case scenario, um, you know quite ahead of time if athletes, coaches um, will be going to the games, and Jeff, you and I have spoken about this before, um, but reality is oftentimes you find out um, weeks, months, one or two months before the Olympic Games that you've been named. So I just want to get perspective on the balance between proper preparation for the enormity of the games versus getting ahead of yourselves and thinking, preparing for the games before you've even been named to the, to the teams. Are you talking about as an MPC? Any. Or oh, any. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can just go quickly. One recommendation I would have is as quickly as possible to get it involved and start talking to the Sport Federation you go, you'll be going with because everyone has some, some kind of a plan in terms of what's your role at the games and where you're going to be, 
how long you're going to be there, and et cetera. So I would say that's probably the most important thing because every federation goes as a team. So, so I would just say yeah. That. And I'd say in terms of that preparation and the the, the time uh, period, uh, most athletes will say Olympic trials. If there's an Olympic trials, is more stressful than the games. Yeah. Um, and it depends on the sport. Sometimes it's a series of five events. Uh, sometimes it's one Olympic trials. Uh, I think in, in the States, uh, track and field and swimming do a very good job of this because many of our sports, uh, you have Olympic trials uh, and you're competing against your teammates for a limited number of spots. And then three weeks later, you're expected to come together genuinely as Team USA. Um, and one team building summit a week before the games is not going to do it, right? And so you have to think about those cultural things in advance and uh, the periodization piece of you know, how do you get up for Olympic trials or multiple Olympic trials uh, and then recover quickly with the travel to get prepared. And, and, and some of the events, even in the Olympics, are not competed in that way at any World Cup. And so getting ready for not only, you know, I've just made the team, but now I have to do something that's, that's new in a few weeks. Um, and it's it, like everything else, it's parents and friends. So we tell our parents and friends, as I'm sure you all do, you want to go to the games, great. Don't ask your child about it. Don't, you know, can you get me tickets? Can you? You're not going to know until three weeks ahead of time if you're going to have a child going to the game. So go ahead and get your ticket. Go ahead and fly and get a hotel and know that your child may not be competing, but they don't need to be your travel agent at that time. So Thanks, it, it creates some challenges. Yeah. Thank you. Here. Hi, Karen. Uh, I was uh, really interested in with that idea of being your best when it matters. How did that change maybe some of the decisions the team made in the lead up, whether it was choosing competitions or something concrete that may have been different than the last quad? So um, how do you be your best self? And sorry, can you just clarify? OK, so the really trying to periodize it so they're at their best at the Olympics. How did that change uh, decisions made before the games? Gotcha, gotcha. And, and so I think it is, and actually it was Sandra Kampoff's podcast of Sean McCain, McCann, McCain, McCann, um, uh, talking a little bit about, you know what, we don't know how this is going to unfold. And, and like what you're saying is you've got to peak for the games or you've got to be, you know, in different points. Is that kind of what you're talking about with the periodization? Yeah, I'm just wondering how yeah. that kind of changed the values and then how that changed decisions leading up to it that may have been different. Yeah, and so with that, and I, I, I hope I'm, I'm going to answer it correctly, but, you know, that whole idea of uh, being your best self is it's really around, um, you know, Sean talked about what are the behaviors that I need to produce consistently. I don't know what's going to happen in this environment, or it may be for a gold medal here, or I may just be training on this day. But what are the behaviors I want to reproduce consistently, no matter what the context, right? So I think part of that, as we're talking about being your best self, it is it's kind of mapping, process mapping a little bit. We did a lot of work on self-expertise and brand, personal brand. How do I want to show up? Who, what do I want to be known for, whether it's the Olympic Games or whether it's a, a volunteer or a, a, um, a local event, right? So I think doing some work on self, doing some work on process, um, and then identifying what the context demands. So Thank I you. hope that answered the question. Thank you. Again. Yes, hi. Thanks a lot for sharing your story so far. And I have one question. When we were talking a little bit about um, the best experience for the Olympics being having been there before. Uh, one story that ran uh, during the Olympics that really caught my attention was Chloe Kim's gold medal performance. And uh, the tweets that she was tweeting out before her performance about her food making he, her feel queasy. And uh, it got me thinking, is that an athlete having gone through the X Games and been in that environment before? Or is it also a process of normalizing what she's going through in the present moment? I guess I'll try to address that broadly. Um, I don't know if this will answer your question, but um, in many of the current Winter Olympic sports, um, they've only recently become Olympic sports. And many of the athletes will still say, well, actually, the X Games are bigger and more important. And so it's still not like the Olympics, uh, necessarily, in terms of the, the setting and the environment. But uh, in their mind, it has been, in some ways, a bigger event. And that's changing, I think, for a number of reasons. But um, I think being able to take that experience into the Olympics was, was helpful to, uh, for her and for many athletes to be able to adapt. Um, and we talked to the athletes about social media and, and you know, how to 
you know, not just don't do it, but how to use it effectively or build a brand or share your experience and, um, and how to deal with sort of social media backlash if there is any. And, and some athletes just decide to turn it off completely, you know, going into and during the games. And, but I don't know. I've never been a, you know, young teenage female, so I don't know what it's like, but I wouldn't want to, like, not be a attached to my phone all the time, the way that so many of them are. And so that was just part of her lived experience there. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Um, my question, we've, I've been listening to you all speak about uh, preparing for this specific context of being in the Olympics, the cues and contingencies that are specific to that, really talking about the moment. Um, and at the same time, I've, I've heard you all or some speak about the importance of being mindful and being present. Um, I'm wondering when you're preparing athletes uh, for going into this context, if there's almost any paradox or challenge in talking about being present in a moment that's in the future and from a relational frame theory, talking about it being such a big moment and if that almost takes away from their ability to be present for maybe their next world championship or for the training opportunity here and, and then what does that mean when they leave the Olympics and they're no longer in that kind of big moment and if, if we're talking about being mindful and being present to the moment here, if, if there's a way to work with understanding that it is, uh, we come to that honestly, it is the Olympics, um, but also the ability to be present in the context here and, and maybe most fully engaged. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great question. You know, uh, mindfulness, um, deep awareness of, of the present moment in an open and curious way, preparation, what are all the million things that are going to happen to you and make sure you plan for that, right? And so I, th I think the thing is, is once again, how do we give our athletes um, build capacity so that they can handle the stressors and demands? And I think that's, that's a lot, I don't know if you guys would agree, but in the preparation, the, the, the mental performance, the resilience, the mental health, making sure that you have the vessel needed. And then I think it's the, the regulation in the context. And that's where the mindfulness can come in, where it's like, well, I planned this. This is not the context right now. Um, there's an awesome book, Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why. And, and what he talked about survivors, and, and sometimes with our athletes, that's what it's about, is we need to adapt to the current context. So the mental map of what we prepared isn't what the, the environment is giving us. So that mindfulness, that ability to regulate in that moment and say, actually, I need to do this, not that, but we've given them the preparations and the, the, the mental, mental fitness toolkit or, or whatever toolkit to be able to adapt within that. So it's, it's kind of, it is a paradox, but it's working them together. I, I would steal a line out of my colleague, uh, Peter Haverill's playbook, and I would say, this is the perfect way to practice. Mm -hmm. It's perfect, it's so shiny. Oh, here comes the Olympic Games. Oh, right. oh, no, we're gonna, we're gonna prepare, but now you're gonna train. <laughs> and like, we're preparing for the Olympics, but here you are at yeah. practice, right? Because then you're gonna be at the games and your mind is gonna be like intermittently flashing to the podium. I mean, you're gonna see the medal going around your neck, or not. I mean, whatever the fantasy or the hope or the fear, I mean, it's going to steal your attention to the future. So it, it, while it may feel like a paradox, it is explicitly the best opportunity to practice yeah, under. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's not coming from me, that's Peter's words. <laughs> yeah. Just repeating them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. I, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you for your attention. And um, thank, you. thank you to ASP for arranging this. And we hope that at future conferences, um, practitioners can share about their very interesting experiences. Thank you. Thank you.